My name is Torsten Norgard. I'm a Danish photographer. I travel the world taking photographs and teaching photography. Today I will tell about the Nox Lux. It's a lens I never get tired of talking about and if you don't get tired of listening to it, then it's the perfect match. The Nox Lux is an amazing lens. It's one of a kind and I have here on my Leica M10P, I have the 50mm 0.95 Noxlux that came out in 2008. This one is one I used uh, for quite a few years, uh, before that I used the other Noxluxes. Uh, you can see this one is pretty beat up, so let's just start with the cosmetics of a Noxlux. Um, this one has a built-in shade that you can pull out here. So. It's supposed to shade for light coming in from the side. Uh, it's not a big thing these days, I would say, because the lenses are coated. So even if you have a little bit of light coming in, it's not going to create a lot of reflections like it used to do uh, in older lenses where you didn't have coating. The irony of this one is that <coughs> I actually make my own ventilated shades for lenses and you could say yeah, it does matter with uh, the light a little bit coming in from the side. Uh, but the main thing I use them for is for protection. Uh, so I can simply sit on like this. So I simply screw in here. Um, and when I say the irony is that if I had put on this one on this lens, I would have saved uh, some trouble and some money because uh, this front of the lens here, I have dropped it on the floor, hit stuff like several times. So I actually had the front here uh, changed three times and it should be changed the four times now because it has a dent here so I cannot use the filter thread. It's not terribly expensive to get done, you simply send it to Leica in Germany and then they have the spare parts here. Uh, sometimes they can just uh, fix any bends in uh, the lens shade or they change it. And it's like metal parts for like 5 or 15 euros and then the labor. So it's never really expensive. Uh, the only thing is that when the, the filler thread is uh, bent, then they have to change all this, this in here with the inscription. And the trouble is that this one has the serial number, so they have to send out the spare part outside the house to get the serial number engraved and then put it on. So it usually takes a few days. Um, <clears throat> but apart from that, uh, it's not a, not a big deal. And speaking of cosmetics, then I always use my Noxlux uh, 0.95 like this, without the shade. One of the reasons I don't use the shade is that simply that it shades for the rangefinder range finder here. Uh, you, get used to, you can get used to it, but it's just, I, don't, I think it's a little bit too much. Uh, it is kind of practical to have it on, it takes the, the bumps and everything. Um, but somehow I always use this lens uh, without it. And that's a decision I made when I got this lens because it's a little bit different than the previous ones I had. Is that it's, it's kind of like, it's just as compact as those but it's kind of like a chunk. And you would be afraid that you're going to scratch the front glass. And I never scratched the front glass on this one. Uh, and also, I will say the glass on uh, lenses is pretty resistant these days. It's, it's hard glass. In some cases, for example, the 28 uh, Sumilux lens from Leica has the front glass on that one is not an optical glass. It's just for protective. So it, it's because the glass behind it is a kind of soft glass. So they put a layer of really strong glass in front of it. This glass is not easy to scratch. Uh, it's like the glasses I have here, they're not easy to scratch, it's like special glass. Uh, and that also means if you put on a UV filter on this one to protect it, you're actually going to put on a glass that is less resistant to scratches than this one. Uh, and the Noclus is the one lens where the manual actually says don't put on a UV filter because it can cause uh, reflections inside the lens. Anyway, that was just the cosmetics of it. Let's go back in history and see uh, where did the Noctus come from, also because it just came out a new remake of the first Noctilux. It wasn't actually the very first Noctilux, the very first Noctilux was one that uh, in the end of the 50s, Leica actually tried to make a 52mm 1.0 lens. In, uh, they did it in the factory in Canada, uh, where the lens designer uh, Mantler was, and he had an interesting team, and they were the first 
who start to do computer, computerized uh, lens design. They simply got a computer and they, they made a program how to design lenses by the help of a computer. So they were like high-end nerds in Canada. It was a copy of the German factory in Wetzlar. Same story, both places. They just had two places. That was a thing like I had learned after Second World War and First World War, that having a factory just in one country is a bad idea because stuff can happen. So that's why they did the factory in Canada. They also had one in, uh, they tried to have one in France and uh, New York or in, in the US and different places. But they built a big back factory in, uh, in Canada. And the guys in Canada experimented with these low light lenses. And they're not the only ones, Canon and everybody else was trying to do low light lenses. And the way that you kind of did a low light lens back then, if you didn't know better, was you would, for example, take a 1.4 lens and then you would just open up the aperture wider. So it became a 1.0 or 0.85 lens or something like that. But the lens wasn't really designed to handle all this light. I mean, there's a lot of light coming in and the optics have to control the light rays so they meet in the right place on the sensor on the film. So low light lenses did exist and it was something you would say there was a market for it because a lot of reportage photographers and war photographers they wanted low light lenses so they could photograph at night because you didn't have uh, the 12,000 ISO or 6,400 ISO. You had film back then so you had maybe 200 ISO or 400 ISO and you could have a few fast film that was 3,200 ISO. Uh, but shooting at night out in the landscape where there's no light almost, you need a low light lens. Also the military requested special lenses and uh, Leica uh, built them in Canada also for the US military. They made low light lenses in like small batches of 10 or 20 or 30. Uh, small 10 lenses, 75 millimeter, 90 millimeter, uh, 1.0 and 0.85. In any case, in the end of the 50s, they tried to do a 52mm 1.0. They weren't happy with the result. And then finally, in uh, like five, six, eight years later, they managed to make a 50mm 1.2 knock loose. And that's the one that has just been remade. But back then, they made this lens, and it was actually the first low light lens of all brands that had high contrast and high quality for that uh, day and age. And, uh, Back then, the lens had also impl implemented uh, two aspherical elements. And there was some that they had one machine in Canada that could do this, and they had one guy who could operate this machine. So it's called hand grinded, and it also means that there was made like 750 uh, Noclux 50 1.2 in, uh, in a period of like uh, of 10 years. And so you can say, they, they said back then it's a big success, this lens, or today we say, oh, it was a big success. But it's, I mean, they made 7, 1,750 lenses in 10 years, so it's not like, it was like, not like the iPhone or something, you know, that there's some millions. But a fairly expensive lens and rare and exotic lens back then, and it did sell, it was a good quality. Of course, because it was hand grinded and handmade in, in many ways, and it was so... I mean, when you open the lens up like this, you have to have a lot of precision. So some of those lenses are really good and some is less good. So it's kind of like if you go in the market, I mean, now it's a collector's item, so it's not really that important how, how great it is at taking pictures. None of them are really bad, uh, but some of them are really good. And, uh, but, but I mean, they sell for like 25 to 50,000 uh, secondhand because it's a collector's item. So I mean, even that was made 750, but of course, a lot of them has lost in all kinds of incidents. And then God knows how many is left, but that's like a collector's market. And now came in 2021, came a remake of the 51.2 uh, with today's type of glass, but the same look and everything. And they only changed the, the fill of it on the new one is 49 millimeters. So now you can actually put on a real, a real filler. I can put on, I make these ones in black and red and green and everything in E49. So those one will fit. And it also comes with a clip on lens shade in, uh, that's gonna fit that uh, lens. And this is, so the new one is supposed to be unlimited and it's gonna be to, with today's persistent grinding and persisting assembling. So it's gonna be a different story. It's not gonna be like some of them are really good and some of them are not that good. It's gonna be pretty consistent. 
So, like I made this one, and yeah, it was a, it's a, you could say, a fairly good, a pretty good lens. Uh, but then the CEO and chief lens designer, Mantler, in, uh, in Canada said, okay, no, we have to make uh, an impossible lens, we have to make a 50, 1.0. And there was a lot of uh, grinding and crying and everything in the factory because that was not possible to do. But finally it was possible to do. And then Leica came out with a 50 millimeter 1.0 lens. And that design has been so great that it, it went from 1976 to 2008 basically. So the optical design was the same and it's just uh, how it was packaged that was, that was changing. Uh, so the first, this is a, has a 60 millimeter uh, filler thread, so you could say it has a 60 millimeter opening here basically. Uh, the first one that came in 76 had 58 millimeter and then only lasted for two or four years, then they expanded it so it became a, a E60, a 60 millimeter uh, filler thread, so you didn't have dark corners uh, in, uh, in the picture. And that went on for a while, and then, rumor has it, uh, from reliable source, I have it that in around 19, 1981, 1980, uh, Queen Elizabeth of uh, England, that is a Leica user, she had the Noclux and she ripped a dress, she ruined a dress because it had two pieces of metal to put on uh, the lens shade. And when you don't have the lens shades on, those, those things can just rip your clothes and that's what happened. And apparently that's what forced Leica to make a new version that didn't have that. So that came out in 82 and that one went on for <coughs> a while and then came in 1993 like it made a new design it became the lens seemingly became more compact and then had a built-in uh, plastic hood that was a little bit square um, I never liked that one I never used that one I used the previous ones and I used uh, the new ones but that one went on for a long while and then in the beginning of the 2000s then Peter Carver had to uh, redesign, that's the current lens designer I'd like, a chief lens designer, Peter Carver, he had to redesign the knock loops. And there was different restrainments that they had to have the same size. They had to use new uh, glass type that was less exotic in the meaning that they weren't that difficult to get because the previous Noxus models had the thing that, I don't know if it's true, but apparently some of the glass had to be uh, heated up underground for two years and, and stuff like that. So it's very unpredictable how long it would take for you to get a Noxus. There was a waiting list, so it would take two years or a year or something like that. And the new model would have to use, you could say, glass types with new characteristics, new possibilities. And it also had to be something that was actually available, something that could be made in batches, like with shorter than one or two years. Um, and Peter Carver and his team had some fun with this, I think, because they said, okay, we're going to make a lens that have the same proportions, um, but we're going to make it more light strong. We're going to beat the 1.0, we're going to make a 0.95 lens. And that's basically what they did. Um, this one had the same uh, size proportions as the previous model, but it has, it's a 0.95 and not 1.0. And what does that mean? Well, that means that uh, when a 50 millimeter lens is uh, 1.0, here yeah, there's different different things. So 50 millimeter means that from the center of focus inside the lens to the sensor which is around here, there's 50 millimeters. That's why it's called a 50 millimeter. That's not how we, you and I, think about a 50. We think 50 is this, 35 is this, 21 is like this. Uh, but for a lens designer, 50 millimeter means 50 millimeters from the center of focus to the film plane or the sensor plane. So when you have a 50 1.0, yes, there's 50 millimeter from here, but also 50 1.0 means that the, that the whole through here is a 50 millimeter diameter. So you could say when you then have a 50 millimeter that you say is 0.95, then it has to be bigger than 50 millimeter, and then the lens would be bigger. So that was the trick that they managed to do a lens that is actually not bigger, but 
the whole flu is bigger. So that's the accomplishment, and then they implemented uh, a spherical uh, elements, two of them, and they also implemented what is called floating elements, and it's not elements floating around in the lens, <coughs> but it just means that there's things moving separately inside the lens when you go close focus, and that improves the image quality. Um, <coughs> so, all if we talk image, then the 50 1.2 Noctilux, the original one, had a very, uh, you could say, exciting uh, look. And the new remake of it has the same look. So it's not a perfect lens, you could say, when you shoot it wide open at 1.2, and you should, why would you buy a lens that is 50 1.2 or 50? 0.95 and not use it at 0.95 or 1.2. You're not supposed to use it at f8 or something like that. You're supposed to use it wide open, and then you get this Noctux look that is very, very special. And let me just say here, I'm a little bit double standard because when, like I said, we're going to make a remake of the 50 1.2. Uh, I heard about this, and I talked to a couple of guys that like it, and I just mentioned. Like I, I pretended like I didn't know anything about it, and it could be interesting to make a 51.2 and then make it as perfect as you can today. Because like I have made the 50.1.2, uh, that's also a Peter Carver design, exactly this one. Uh, I have made a 51.2 or 1.4 here, that is a, an amazing lens, it's very high contrast, very sharp. It has the bouquet, which means the outer focus area, have this uh, silky smooth look, especially on black and white. Very uh, fantastic lens. Then you have the Noctilux, then things go uh, right to the edge. It becomes very dreamy and very blurry and everything. Uh, it still have control of the image, but not as much as this one. So what I imagine is like, what if you made a 1.2? It would be kind of like the Noctilux wildness and rock and roll, uh, but with some of the colors and the control at the 1.4. The irony of this that makes me a little bit of like, uh, I don't know what you call it, um, <clears throat> is that I didn't like the idea to remake a 51.2 without optimizing the design because it's not a, the 1.2 was not a perfect lens in any way. It has like the dreamy look that is kind of like the Noctilus look, but it didn't have anything on the real control. You don't have anything at 1.2 that is really sharp. Then you can say that's a charm. The irony of this is that I talked to lens designer Peter Carper and Leica makes all the new uh, L lenses for the Leica SL uh, and also the new 90 and 75 lenses for the M system and they're so perfect. So it's almost boring. So I said to him, can you make some rock and roll lenses? And in a way you could say, well, Peter Carver didn't make this one. He had to remake it with uh, different glass types, but he had to stay with the old design and make it like that. But you could say in that sense, the 50 1.2 is actually a rock and roll lens because it has some control of things, but you also have a lot of things out of control, so you can make magic with it. And that is kind of like the signature of Noctilux, that you can make magic with it. And I usually say that I'm not interested in photographing the world as it is, or reality. I want to create dreams. I have a vision of how I want a picture to look. And the Noctilux allow me to do that. So when we talk, uh, when you go to the uh, 51.0, lenses that went on from 76 to 2008, you have high precision, you have a high level of precision, and you have this Noctus look that is very dreamy, and, and it's just there's nothing else like it. You could say, uh, you can go Canon, the 85, 1.2, 1.4, have similar dreamy, it's very filmic look, uh, <clears throat> but Leica Noctus is actually the only lens in the world that performs like this, that it has so much control of sharpness, and then still so much out of control. And then when we go to the 50.95, then we get noticeably better uh, detail sharpness and contrast, higher contrast. And that's something you can actually see when you go a 50 uh, 1.0 that I used to use. When you look through that lens in a viewfinder, electronic viewfinder on the camera, which is not a huge screen or anything, but even in that little viewfinder, you can see that when you go 0.95, it gets a little bit more crisp, or actually a, a lot more crisp, but the all Noctis look doesn't change from the 1.0 to 0.95, it's just you get more detail and, uh, and uh, sharpness and, and higher contrast. And you could say you also get 
better colors, more precise colors, more defined colors. Um, so if you should, you would say, if you should get into the knock looks like if you have this feeling like, oh, I really want a knock looks, then one way to do it that I can advise is that you can start with the 51.2 because that is a knock looks and it's an exciting lens. And you would say with today's sensor, 40 megapixel sensors, and also monochrome cameras that have 40 megapixel sensors, but no Bayer fillers, you really get, you can get crispy details, but then you put on a lens that is not really very crisp but still it have a lot of signature that you can see in high resolution. That's a good place to start. Then when you get tired of uh, this slightly blur blurry look of things you try to get in total focus, then you can go to the 1.0, then find a 1.0 from the 80s or something, and then you will see an overall improvement. And then you shoot with this for a while, some months or years, and then you go 0.95, and now you get still the same knockless look, but you just get crispy details, you get more sharpness basically, more clarity. Um, and the way I recommend that route is because that's almost what I did. Uh, if I started with the 0.95 and then I go back to 1.0, it just doesn't make any sense. Why would I downgrade to a lens that, that renders uh, not as perfect as this one? Because the overall look is the same. So that could be a route to take 51.2, then you improve, you go 1.0 and then you go 0.95 and this way you get to be part of the history back from 1966 and up till today. And of course at some point there will be coming a new knock looks. Uh, it's not something that is imminent, it's not happening right now. What is happening is that Leica came out with a 75 uh, knock looks, so the 75 1.25 and it have a lot of the looks qualities. It's almost too perfect both because it's like what Peter Carpa and his, and his design team strive for, they wanted to have something that is like optimum. But also when you go from 50 to 75, you just get more control of everything. So that's what happened with that one. And then came the 90 uh, 1.5, which is sort of also a Noctlux, but it's not really a Noctlux. And then there's the rumored uh, 35.8, I think it's gonna be, that's my hope. And, and if you calculate 91.5, 71.25, 50.95, then 35 should be 0 0.08. We'll see if that happens and when it happens, but it's, that's kind of the direction it's going. Um, <clears throat> one interesting thing that I'll also say about the Noxlux is that uh, the first lenses had uh, lead in them. This is not unusual. A lot of uh, optics for the last 250 years have had lead in them. It has some specific qualities and some optics for other things you would have more lead but around the 90s they said okay no more lead it's kind of like if you remember now we can't have uh, lead in gasoline and and even like uh, in the old newspapers you were typesetting with uh, letters made of lead uh, but suddenly that was verboten we have to get rid of all the lead uh, so basically all lenses from 2001 2003 have no lead in them so that's one thing that also changed in the knock looks uh, and that means that the 1993 knock looks supposedly doesn't have any lead in it. It doesn't mean anything for you, it means for something for the people who, who make the glass and work with the lenses. Using the lens, you're not going to get any lead, uh, you're not going to inhale the lens. Uh, and when you dispose of, the, dispose of the lens, which is not going to happen uh, anytime soon, then of course you will have to put it in a different basket because it has lead. Uh, but that's almost just fear of us, but just interesting uh, little uh, detail. Um, that's about what I had to say, I think, about the knock looks today. Uh, I mean, I'll get back to it. One thing I have been doing is I have just recently been doing a uh, school of knock looks. So it's a whole video class I've done, like how to focus on knock looks, how to get this narrow depth of field, how to expose a knock looks, uh, and many other things. I mean, I love this lens and I used it a lot. I have so many thousand pictures I've taken with this lens. Uh, so, and people keep asking about it and I keep talking about it. So I decided let me just do a masterclass, a video masterclass on it. So I talk about the knock looks for hours and I go on the street and show how I chase uh, bicycles and people uh, <laughs> and blow out everything. That's kind of like uh, what I do with this lens. Um, that's basically all I had to say today. Till I see you next time, remember to always wear a camera.